Welcome to today's. Well, <laughs> welcome to welcome to today's. Oh, stop it! Oh, stop it! <laughs> stop it! Stop it! Oh, I love it. Welcome to today's episode of the Connected Caroline Show. Yay! I said it right. My guest today is Daniel Levitin. He is the premier neuroscientist in the country uh, who has studied how music affects the brain. His best-selling book, This Is Your Brain on Music, is, uh, is a seminal book on the subject matter. And he's actually the author of five consecutive international best-selling books, including This Is Your Brain on Music, The World in Six Songs, The Organized Mind, which I need to read again, <laughs> A Field Guide to Lies, and Successful Aging, which is going to come up a little bit in our, in our talk today, because Dan... Well, welcome to the show, Dan. How about that? Even though you like were making fun of me in the beginning. Um, welcome to the Connected Caroline podcast. I'm so happy to have you on today. Thanks for joining us. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. So before Should Dan- we tell people we've known each other since uh, we were kids? And uh, that's you know why what? We I was looking for the Camp Beaverbrook shirt that I- bought for the kids during one of the reunions, uh, you know, like 20 years ago. And I couldn't find it because I was going to wear my Camp Beaverbrook shirt. Dan and I are like brother and sister from camp, from a beautiful summer camp we used to go to in uh, Northern California. He and his sister and I became like family friends. And we've known each other since we were, I don't know, how old was I? 11 when I met you? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe younger. So... Yeah, so when you were 11, 20 years ago. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, so it's been awesome to watch your career um, skyrocket. And, uh, you know, all of us from, we, we're called beaver bods. And all the beaver bods are so proud of Dan and all his accomplishments. Oh. And also being just, you know, remaining a completely normal, well, whatever that means for us beaver bods. But completely wonderful down to earth person. So, um, yeah. So anyway, so part of Dan's story is that he was a, he's, he is a musician and a producer founder of record labels. He's, he's truly a Renaissance man. He, uh, has worked with artists such as Blue Oyster Cult, Santana, Stevie Wonder. Um, and one of the things we're going to, we're going to talk about a lot is his latest album called sex and math where do i have it upside there we go sex and math that he wrote uh he's written all the songs 13, it's a full-length album and he was inspired by his friend joni mitchell to do this and part of this is dan is of a certain age and successful aging and doing a project like recording and his passion is music, obviously. Um, he has used music to be the fundamental backdrop to two careers. Um, it, this is where, what he wanted to do as he was you know, moving into his 60s. So Dan, why don't you like take it from here and talk about sex and math and what, what was the inspiration behind it? So, um, first on the title, my friend Rodney Crowell had an album called Sex and Gasoline, and I liked that title. Um, and for this record, I was talking to my friend Christopher Harrison, a wonderful producer and singer and arranger, who uh, said that he thought Sex and Math was a good title. It echoed Rodney's title. And really, sex and math covers a lot of the world that we care about. I have a former student, Susan Rogers, who's got a book coming out in the fall with O.G. Ogas about, really, it's a, a book about the psychology of music. It's a wonderful book called This Is What It Sounds Like. And she makes this distinction that some people listen to music using the part of their body that's above the neck, and some people <laughs> listen below the neck. And so that's sort of the, the sex and the math. Fantastic. That's a great explanation. Nice PG explanation. So um, let's, let's discuss where you are in your career. Have you retired from being a 
active neuroscience. I know that you still are a professor um, emeritus. Is that how you say it? Emeritus. Emeritus at McGill University, where you had your lab and and um, had all kinds of amazing discoveries of music affects the brain. And why don't you go ahead and talk about that and what you're doing now and why you decided to create this CD. This is the second full length album that you've done in your lifetime. You've worked on other rock stars albums and were a seminal part of the San Francisco music industry um, in the 80s and 70s, well, the 80s probably, yeah, with 415 Records and working with all these very famous new wave bands and things like that. Um, so the history is, a, is like a whole nother podcast of all the people and places that you've seen back in the music business. What made you want to do your own record again? Well, um, starting on the first question, have I retired? Uh, <laughs> and then uh, sort of. Uh, I was at McGill where I still have a lab and I still uh, have research grants and, and conduct research. The emeritus title means that I stopped taking a salary so that they could hire a younger person <laughs> Uh, and so now I do all the things I used to do before. I just don't get paid for them, but that's okay. Uh, and, uh, that's I, truly yes, passion around what you do. <laughs> I'm still very active as a scientist. I've got a, a wonderful lab group of six people and, uh, I'm mentoring the scientists of tomorrow in terms of the album. Uh, I, I've been playing music all my life and I had been in a series of bands and I've been writing songs since I was a teenager, mostly to explore my own feelings and my own emotions um, in ways that I, I, I often would be at a loss for words to characterize what I was feeling. But if I attached those words to the right chords and melody, it felt more accurate, more evocative of the feeling. And your... even now I can, I can play a song I wrote 40 years ago and the words alone don't bring me back to that feeling, but the song sure does. I want to get back to that because some of us, some people are lyric people and some people are melody people. And we'll get back to that really quick. But was your experience as a producer, uh, uh, rock and roll mainly, right? Rock producer and musician, uh, did that did that spark your interest to go into neuroscience? Because you went into neuroscience in your 30s, right? Well, it was two things. The record business started to implode and <laughs> everyone in my cohort saw it, saw it coming. And so we all figured we should have a plan B. And my plan B, I had started out as a neuroscience major. And so my plan B was to go back to it and to look at music. Inspired by a moment with Carlos Santana in the studio where he was playing a solo out in the room and I was in the control room and I got these shivers down my spine and I, I mean, that wasn't an unusual thing uh, to, to, to have happened to me. Uh, but that particular day I thought, well, why is this happening? And maybe neuroscience can tell me. What studio were you in? The Automat. The old CBS studios on Folsom Street in San Francisco. I love that. Um, and so, so very I've interesting. Writing, I've been writing music all along. And when I played my songs for bandmates or for, you know, various rock stars I was working with, they tended to like the songs. Um, OK, they didn't like my singing. And every band I was in told me not to sing. And about 10 years ago, uh, Joni Mitchell and Rodney Crowell uh, were, took more of an interest in my songwriting. Separately, uh, you know, because Rodney's in Nashville, Joni's here in LA with me, um, gave me, gave me advice about how to approach the songwriting to make the songs more compelling. And, and that it was really the lyrics there. They had no, neither of them had a comment about chords or melody. I always felt I was good at that part. And I used the Paul McCartney test, uh, which is if I get a song in my head, I don't record it. And if I can remember it a few days later, it means that it must be sticky. Oh, that's a good, that's, I like that litmus test. Nice. 
<laughs> but so the lyrics had to get together, and uh, Rodney and Joni gave me these approaches um, how to think about building on a theme or um, exploring an emotion more deeply. Rodney's advice was always get out of your head. You know, I'd have a line like, I think that. He said, no, 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 nobody cares what you think. Music's emotional. Tell us what you're feeling. Um, and I had a line in a song where I said, I don't know how I feel. And Joni said, then don't write the song, you idiot. <laughs> she said, it's your job as the songwriter to be able to put into words and music how you feel. That's why the listener's coming. And if you can't do that, you have no business writing that song and maybe no business being a songwriter. So she, you know, we had this sort of therapy session where in her words, we peeled back the layers of the onion and we got to what the emotions were. After that, after working more diligently on, on all of the craft and going back over some of the 40 year old songs, um, people still told me they didn't like the way I sang. And I asked Joni about it, and she says, oh, I think I know what they mean. She says, I like listening to your songs. I, I'm humming them when you're gone, and you know, I always like you to play me what you're working on. We, we'd get together at her house for dinner about once a month, and she'd play me what she was working on, and I'd play her what I was working on. And I just got to hit pause here and say, sitting on the piano bench next to Joni while she's playing a new song. Oh, yeah, I was going to say. It's like dream come true. <laughs> I mean, you know, you like pinching yourself, even though, you know, there's just some people that you're like, am I really sitting next to her? And she's it's, just it's noodling amazing. on the I mean, piano. <laughs> that, that, that is sort of a producer's job, you know, to hear the song before anyone else does. And you, you're an audience of one, but it still never gets old or, or you know, I, I always cry when that happens. It's just so moving. I get it. Uh, I get it. I heard the Donald Fagan album, Sunken Condos, uh, before it came out. And I cried then. Just, I mean, wow. This is... It's I really mean. it's really a feeling of... Um, because it's, it's, it's so emotional, it's like part... It, again, back to what you're talking about, about the feeling and the emotion. It's like a, you know, it's like a baby that they've birthed, a song. And... For when they're done playing it for you before it's ever been released or even mixed or whatever, it's like it's so it is emotional. There's this relief. I don't know. It's it's a it's a special thing. And working in the music business, those are the those are the moments that are that are definitely the gold, yeah. for sure for me. Those private moments where they're almost you say nothing. You're just like oh. Wow. I was I was, was I, I yeah I mean, it's 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 extraordinary. It was my friend Michael Lenhart, uh, who's the music director for Steely Dan, who produced Sunken Condos, and he had me over at his house in Manhattan. He played me, you know, the direct files from the digital workstation, and it was it was just awesome. Uh, so anyway, getting to the singing, um, Joni said, "I think I know what what people are hearing." She says. When you sing, it sounds like you're trying to be a singer. She, she said, if you look at opera singers, you know, we both like Renee Fleming, we like Placido Domingo. Uh, she said, that's an affectation. It's, it's a requirement of the job that, you know, they sort of find that voice and cultivate it. And there is the operatic voice. But she said, for the kind of music that we're making, she said, we. <laughs> She said, people don't typically want that. They want to hear the story and they don't want the voice to get in the way of it. And, you know, she, over a period of very precise lessons where she broke down syllable by syllable what I was doing in a few songs, she taught me to um, just stop thinking about the voice. Stop thinking that I have a voice. Stop thinking about what I'm going to do with it. Just let the story come out. I, she says, you know the song. You know, just turn off that part of your brain that is thinking singer and turn back on the part of the brain that wrote the song and let the song sing the song. That's and, that head and heart thing, yeah. right? Turn off the head and let the heart lead. 
And it seems like through your career, that's almost your been your whole uh, your whole journey. You know, is exploring that how to how to express your heart feeling. You know, that heart because uh, clearly the the head part, the cerebral part, is is very fine tuned. But always searching on how to communicate through the heart. So it's hard for a lot of people. It's tricky, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I got I got scammed by somebody recently, and you know, the Dalai Lama says you want to feel compassion even for your enemies, but you know, I'm mad at this person, and <laughs> my head is saying, you know, this person messed messed you up. Uh, I was going to use an F word, but you know what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> you can uh, swear then, on my you know, podcast. <laughs> and you want to keep your heart open to um, to people, but you need to protect yourself. It's, it's complicated. And I wouldn't say there's no room for the heart in science, uh, not at all. I mean, it's, it's the heart or the emotions that create the curiosity that makes you wanna pursue something scientifically, and then the brain comes in. And it really is a balance. Rodney was uh, particularly helpful in, um, when the songs were done, or so I thought, and I was now letting the song sing instead of me singing. And I had the whole album recorded. Rodney came back after it was done and he said, you know, I think we should change a few words. If you don't mind going back at the studio. And it was about letting more heart in, but it was using his brain and my brain to figure out how to do that. So the collaboration was the magic. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. And of course, you're working with Joni Mitchell, Rodney Crowell. <laughs> I wrote a song Magical. on the record with Livingston Taylor, a wonderful songwriter, many hits, James's brother. Uh, and on, on that song, we had this line, it's about an abusive relationship. It's a very dark song and um, called Johnny and Linda, which some people say is their favorite, actually. Um, I had this line about this abusive, you know, sort of um, tank top wearing guy, trailer park kind of thing. Um, and I, the line was, Johnny came home drunk again, cursing up a storm. Livingston said, he didn't come home drunk again, he came home whiskeyed up. That gets you a little bit more of the emotion and the mm -hmm. physicality mm -hmm. drunk again is just sort of abstract whiskeyed up has more sensory qualities to it and then rodney yeah you said, can you can smell it that's right that's right exactly right yeah and livingston and rodney are all and Joni are all about the sensory part and all three of them would say to me get out of your head and get into the sensory environment and around this time, I was teaching a songwriting course with Bernie Taupin and Rodney Crowell and Lisa Loeb. Uh, and <laughs> Bernie was saying that he tries to envision before he writes any lyrics for Elton, a very particular place, you know, sat on the roof, kicked off the moss. He's envisioning a very particular place and all of the sensory stuff in it before he puts a, a single word on paper. And then he draws from that image. That's where the moss comes from. You, otherwise, you wouldn't have it. You might not even be sitting on the roof, you know. Uh, so it was, the, the whiskeyed up came from that and, and other things too. And then Rodney said, you know, he wouldn't be cursing up a storm. He says, you have to use the vernacular. This guy would be cussing up a storm. <laughs> and these little things matter. So you yeah. talk about the head and the heart balancing. It's, it's both. You don't, and, and spending time with these three, and I would add Stevie Wonder, they are four people, and I don't know anyone else like this. I'm sure there are a lot. I just happen not to know them. Their lives seem to be in perfect balance. Oh, I would add another, Victor Wooten. They, they travel between their head, their heart, their spirit, and their body, and they never spend more time in one than the other. They're, they've got a, a complete equilibrium where the four are working harmoniously. And being in that bubble, 
is extraordinary. I imagine that there are some corporate leaders who are like that, some visionaries, the creative people who lead companies, but I don't really know. I, the only ones I know happen to be musicians. I think that's what a lot of people who are on the per personal development track now and have been for, you know, forever, I guess. It's been going on since the dawn of time, honestly, is, um, is having that that flow, it's being in the flow, they're in the flow. I don't think a lot of people, I, I know a lot of people intellectually understand what it means to be in the flow and a strive, you know, are aspiring to be in the flow, but it's not an easy task to be in the flow all the time. And some people, as you said, you can tell they're just in the flow and uh, they're great leaders. And I don't know that a lot of great leaders, maybe the Dalai Lama, is in the flow, yeah, uh, you know, maybe Deepak Chopra is in the flow. I don't think a lot of corporate leaders are in the flow. <laughs> I, I, I would say the Dalai Lama, we, we spent uh, an afternoon together and uh, there's a video of us together, a little uh, video on YouTube. The, um, I, he's not an artist and he doesn't listen to music. So the whole aesthetic part isn't there because by his teaching and his training, um, music and uh, sensory pleasures are not encouraged in Tibetan Buddhism. So he he eats because he must eat, mm -hmm. but he avoids fancy foods. It doesn't mean he wouldn't enjoy something tasty and delicious, but it's it's different. Uh, but absolutely, uh, my experience with him was that he he navigated the spiritual the emotional, the physical, uh, and, and the uh, mental um, in perfect balance. And he, he, he's just full of laughter. I have a picture up here on the wall. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but it's us sitting there uh, in his office, and both of us are laughing. And um, it was, it was a lot of laughter because he started off the conversation uh, really with, with a joke and there were jokes over and over again. It's, he's definitely in the flow. He's in the flow for sure. So he's smiling. So, um, getting back to, to my question always, why do some people gravitate towards the lyrics and some people gravitate towards the melody? I mean, I've listened to you know, I've been to hundreds of Grateful Dead-ish, you know, in, incarnation shows and Dave Matthews, and I barely know <laughs> the lyrics, but I can certainly, you know, the second I hear it, the first chord, I, I know what's coming. So why are some people wired that way? We don't know, but I mean, we really don't know. Uh, but there, we don't know much about aesthetic taste in general. Why do some people like spicy food and some people like salty or sweet and some people like bland food, some people like chocolate, some people don't. Uh, sex so there's no happy. neuroscience like answer to that. I would pull out my astrology chart to get information on that. But there's like neuro, neuroscience uh, wise, they're just, it, it, it's just preference. Some people have more into the words and not into the, don't I mean, hear the it's, melody it's, as much. It's, it's clearly some combination of genetic predispositions for how your brain gets constructed and then your experiences as a child and an individual. And there's some random factors, but there is an emerging field called neuroaesthetics that was launched around 2006. Samir Zeki and I and Margaret Livingstone and some others, uh, kind of got this going and Johns Hopkins University now has a neuro arts program and their you know their stated mission is to get to question to be able to answer questions like that yeah I mean it's individual differences but why what's underlying it and uh, you know it's it's really like it's the same with sexual preferences you know we as my grandpa used to say if everybody liked the same thing they'd all want to get with your grandma <laughs> I love your family. <laughs> that's awesome. That's true love, man. Um, yeah, but I get 
Yeah. Well, it's part of the mysteries. There's got to be some mysteries, right? In the world, some magic. Um, so back to sex and math. Um, so there's a, there's 13 songs and there's a special song dedicated to one of our Camp Beaverbrook fellow beaver bods. And do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I had written this song way back in the 80s when I was listening to a lot of Lou Reed and Velvet Underground called This Is My Refrain. And typically when I write, I didn't know this, I haven't known this until recently, but I use, uh, again, it's a Paul McCartney technique. I'm, people ask, do you write the lyrics first or the music first? Uh, no, I'm, I'm sitting at the guitar or piano or without an instrument and I'm I'm just speaking a stream of consciousness of whatever comes in my head. And so I had written this song, This Is My Refrain, based on this Lou Reed vibe, although it's, it's not a Lou Reed song. And it was mostly just nonsense syllables. But when I started reviewing my writing five years ago, going back to this 80s song that I always liked, and I found words that rhymed with the nonsense syllables. I felt that the vowel sounds were what was important to make the song work. Uh, and I, you know, I read later, this is what McCartney does. So not that I'm comparing myself with him, I'm just talking method, but uh, you know, he had, the, before he wrote yesterday, all my trouble seemed so far away, he had the long A sound. He had scrambled eggs, my you have such lovely legs. So that long A sound was there and, that, and he kept with that. So this is my refrain was done. The whole album was done. Uh, I had done the little fixes that Rodney wanted on a few of the lyrics, um, mastered it for a second time. And then uh, this guy that you and I knew as kids, Roger McGregor, whose camp name was Rudy, uh, he was a, a wonderful pianist. And um, he and I had stayed in touch over the years and he died of cancer right as the record was had gone to bed and I was ready to put it out. And Vicky, his widow, through Alan Smith, Gandalf, uh, <laughs> we all had camp names, uh, sent this little digital recording on his phone of a song that he was writing when he died. It was a ragtime piano song called Jenkins Takes a Walk. I assume that Jenkins is the dog in the family, but I don't really know. <laughs> and I heard it and it was so uplifting and cheerful. And it was such a nice way to remember Roger that I wanted to stick it on the album. And my producer, Leo said, well, you could, but it's a little weird since you didn't write it and you're not playing on it. And, you know, I brought up precedent for that on other albums, Fleetwood Mac and Pink Floyd and Simon and Garfunkel had done something <laughs> like that. Uh, but he said, you know, why don't you just write some lyrics on top of that? And I said, okay, I think I don't want to get in the way of the melody, so I'll have to speak them, which is what Be Be Ben Sidron, Leo Sidron's father, has made a career out of doing, you know, these elaborate, wonderful jazz songs, and he speaks the lyrics over mm -hmm. them. And um, I'm quote, kind of half speaking the lyrics in my refrain. So I thought, okay, these will be like a pair now. They'll be bookends, as it were, for side two of the vinyl. Starts with this is my refrain, this sort of talking story. It ends with Jenkins. Uh, and it has some of the same ideas in it. And I, I, it's a funny thing. Uh, I just love that song. I do too. I love it too. Got a great vibe. And it makes me think of red-haired Roger and his mustache. And yeah. <laughs> the 70s look. <laughs> He's a sweet guy. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's really wonderful that you, uh, you know, included that in this in this record. And there's so much love and, you know, like heart to the Sex and Math album. Um, how it, people can stream it. And are you and are you releasing a vinyl I was going product. to, and then the supply chain business, uh, yeah. it, it was going to be yeah. another year, and I just figured. So people can stream people can stream Sex and Math 
Yeah, it's on all the major streaming platforms, uh, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, um, Tidal, uh, YouTube, all the rest. And they can buy a copy if they uh, get in touch with you. We can fulfill orders that way. A CD. You can yeah. buy a CD. Buy a physical CD. And, uh, okay. It has lovely artwork. It does. It has a very, be for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you can see the beautiful, looks like Marin County, Mount Tamalpais Roadway. That's what I'm going to say it is. <laughs> and you can either go by way of sex or by way of math. Yeah. Or sit right in the middle and have your picnic. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. You should be a publicist. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fantastic um, line. Thank you. <laughs> that, I'm like, oh, we'll just sit right there and picnic. I want both. Um, you can have both, baby. You can have both. Okay, so Dan, really quick, um, tell me. Okay, so aging. Your aging. Uh, oh, successful aging. Successful aging. Your book, successful aging, talks about as you get older, the, the like. There's the magic trick is to keep your, you know, interests going. It's part of what it talks about. Why don't you talk about that and like how you like walked your talk by doing your record? Well, so the, you know, if I found out a number of things from neuroscience of aging, uh, not in my own lab mostly, but in, in reading the literature, I read over 4,000 papers to write that book uh, so that you wouldn't have to. Although if you want to, they're all listed in the appendix. Uh, and the, one of the surprising things I found was that the, the simplest way to stay mentally agile and improve your quality of life and your longevity is to remain curious and to try new things and to push yourself outside your comfort zone. And um, I wanted to do that. So the first thing I did was I... I'm afraid of heights, so I took flying lessons to get my private pilot's license. Cool. Which was totally outside my comfort zone. So you can fly now? Yeah, facilitated by Livingston, of all people. Livingston's a great pilot. Oh, seriously? <laughs> uh, and then the next thing I thought was, I'm, I, I'm comfortable playing music on a stage when someone else is doing the singing, and it's someone else's song. The idea of singing my own songs and having the attention on me was ter as terrifying as getting up in a plane. And so I thought, I'm going to tackle that. And it took, it took five years, I would say, to get that all together with learning how to sing and to hone the songs and record them and all. But that was, I learned new skills. I feel younger. The name of the game. Yeah, that book is really... I don't neat. look younger, but I feel younger. Oh, sure you do. You don't look a day over... 16 when I met you or whatever it was, <laughs> 15. Um, yeah, I think that, I think there's a lot of uh, conversation out there about, you know, staying, have not just having a hobby, but like the, the tag to this podcast is passion inspires profit. It's kind of like sex and math. It's like, profit of all kinds, you know, not just fi financial profit, but so what go as you age, keep looking for what makes you passionate. And then to your point, doing something that scares the shit out of you, but you know, you're not going to get eaten by a tiger. So go for it and try it. So um, I think that's why we have a lot of older surfers out there on the, in the water these days because of that fundamental principle. And uh, I love that it's... It's a fun dimental It's a fun <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you know, I'd like to spread that, that message around as well. That, and especially because we're, you know, since 60 is the new 40, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, we really are living longer and um, we've all seen what degenerative uh, disease can do to our loved ones. And so there's lots of tools and techniques that we can do to, you know, bypass that, or at least, you know, take it head on, be, be in control of our destiny as much as possible. So 
even though we have no control. <laughs> you can try, right? <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. So, um, well, wrapping up, uh, I could just, we could go on and on and on. Um, God, we, I, I'd love to do a, a, a follow up and talk about your experience in the 80s in San Francisco and all that fun craziness. Dan Let's and I figured that we had crossed each other's path in the music business over a period of time. We must have walked by each other and just didn't know it because um, we were in the same circle up in the Bay Area. But um, anyway, so yeah, we'll we'll give you all the information on where to how to download sex and math and um, downloading sex sounds a little bit off uh, brand but stream <laughs> and uh, so so this is what's next but is there anything next next i'm making another record writing oh, cool. another book doing new research when's the book out what's the book about we'll talk about it okay and um, doing more research. Yeah, you're, there's never, never a dull moment in your life, for sure. You know, when you've got aging parents, we're, you know, you're, you're in it like the rest of us. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Well, I am so grateful for your time. I know your time is super valuable. And I love you. And I am thank you for being on the show and sharing all this fun <laughs> stuff with, with my audience. And I do hope we can do this again. I do too. Thank you, Caroline. Mm, I love you too. Oh, thank you. And that's a wrap. And until next time, this is Caroline with the Connected Caroline Show. Make it a giving day. <laughs>